Hello, uh, my name is Gemma Bolland. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Scale Factory. If you haven't come across us, we are a SaaS-focused AWS consultancy based in London, but being increasingly international at the moment. Um, COO is one of those jobs that can mean anything or nothing. Uh, and in my case, it just basically means that I look after our people, the money, and make sure that everything we do is legal and compliant. Um, and what better way to start than a bit of talk about Doom and DevOpses. Um, now, uh, I'm actually unexpectedly talking without uh, speaker notes this morning. So if it goes horribly wrong, we're going to call this a live demo. <laughs> so the first thing is, it's obviously more important to prevent things from going wrong than just to react to them. In most cases, prevention is better than cure and minimizing the blast area that a pre-coffee human can make um, is obviously the best thing you can do. But there's one simple fact, that no matter what you do, and no matter how incredible the people you've got around you are, things are gonna go wrong because we're all human and we're all fallible. As a society, we tend to demonize making mistakes. It's really telling that you can use almost any swear word followed by the word up, and it means to make a mistake. But in reality, making mistakes is how we learn, and it's an intrinsic part of anything creative. It's said that Einstein said, oh, that is the wrong slide. Oh. Live demo. OK, I actually managed to find this definition in the actual dictionary. And every single word of it is dripping in judgment. A mistake isn't faulty judgment. A mistake is not uh, inattention or, or somehow being hugely wrong. It's just part of being human. It is said that Einstein said that a person who never made a mistake never did anything new. Well, actually, it's really contingent. Like most big famous quotes, he probably didn't actually say it, but it's kind of a good quote and he's got a good face, so I'm just going to go with it. <coughs> but it's one step further than that. It's not just about creativity and new things. Making mistakes is just a part of everyday life. I would bet even the smartest person you know has tried walking away with their headphones still attached or put salt in their coffee. But to start delving in to our innate reactions, and they are innate and they're very, very built in, to failure, to vulnerability. I want to take you back to the very start of your career. Who here remembers the first proper mistake they made at work? Now, I'm not talking about the kind of thing you could just roll back or reverse, and it was all going to be all right. I mean something that still makes you shudder to this day. I mean, I'm seeing a few hands. The rest of you either never made a mistake, or you just blocked it out of your minds. I'll tell you my story because I, I don't think you'd ever forgive me if I didn't actually tell you a war story in this talk. My story is not actually from DevOps and it's not even from traditional tech. Uh, I started my career in broadcast uh, operations in, in TV. Uh, I was about 22 and I scored a job with a major TV network on their uh, European TV networks broadcast from London. And I was living my best life. I was learning a lot. I had a bit of swagger about me. I had this great job, this great life, and I was killing it. Until one day, on a visit to the transmission suite, I managed to pull the entire channel off air for the whole of Italy <laughs> with the sleeve of my cardigan. Now. <laughs> now, time stood still for a moment. And then 
the entire transmission suite burst into an activity and swearing. And I was mortified. And I would love to tell you that I handled the whole thing with grace and maturity, but I didn't. I ran away and hid in the bathroom. So I'd like to dig in to what was going on for me at that moment. And in the first case, it was abject panic. And the thing about the human brain is that it can't tell the difference between a work mishap and being chased by a very hungry tiger. When we sense danger of any kind, the physiology goes into overdrive. The amygdala sends messages to your central nervous system, your pulse quickens, your breathing gets faster, you're flooded with cortisol and adrenaline, and all the blood goes from your head to your arms and legs to get ready for fight or flight. In my case, I chose flight. Um, but a person in that state is not a person who is going to make good decisions. And what else was going on? Well, you look for a rhyme or reason. You look for a reason that this thing has happened. In my case, it was the fact that I was modeling myself on the original cast of Twin Peaks. But in general, you're looking for the why. And if you can possibly find something outside of yourself to blame, you will. And then at the heart of it all was shame. I don't know if you've seen anything by Brené Brown, but her work on shame and vulnerability, uh, I really rate it. And she says that shame is the most powerful master emotion. It's the thing that tells you that you are not good enough. And that's exactly what was going on in that second. I felt like I'd been found out, that I was a stupid person with stupid clothes and I should never have been in that job in the first place. I was already plotting my escape to go and, I don't know, herd goats up in northern Scotland or something because I did not deserve to even be around people. Because at heart, a lot of us carry that feeling that we're not worthy. And it's, you know, it's the root of imposter syndrome. So you're probably wondering what happened when I finally emerged from that bathroom stall. And the answer is very little. The channel was back up, people were just getting on with it. And other than a couple of like snide comments or little jokes at my expense, nothing happened. I'd expect to be fired or at the very least hauled over the coals, but people just took it on their stride. And that's when I started to learn that you can make mistakes and move on. And it happens to everyone. So then you start to build up a bit of resilience. And, you know, try new things, make your mistakes, learn and carry on again. But you need to still remember that for somebody early career, something that to you seems like nothing could actually be a really big deal. Or in our world, you know, when you're in the early career and you break prod, it's the end of the world. But when you get a bit further on, you go straight to Twitter and tell everyone about it. If you are struggling with the moment of like, you know, when you make a mistake, some of the things I suggest to people when I'm coaching them are first and foremost, like first thing you need to do when something goes wrong is take a breath. I know that sounds really simplistic and I'm not suggesting that you be this guy, um, but I am saying that by taking a breath, you will start to counter those physiological reactions. You'll start to kind of come back into the moment and you're probably going to do a lot better good. Two, shine a light on things a minute you can. Uh, I know it's difficult, but the earlier you kind of show what's going on and ask for help, the better everything is going to be. Then also, like, do get as much help as you can. Like, don't try and fix things on your own. There's probably a number of people around you who have been here 100 times before. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, yeah. And just remember, everyone in that room 
has probably done the same or worse. So don't be afraid to, to ask and, and get help. Now, in an ideal world, that would be the end of my talk. We're done, right? Except for there was a little thing waiting for me that I didn't realize. Once I got confident making my own mistakes, I suddenly realized that those same responses were lying in wait when the people around me made mistakes. So how might those same things show their faces when it's not actually you that might have pushed the wrong button, but somebody in your near vicinity? Well, first, panic. That's going to lead you to go straight in to action mode, to start fixing things and to hyper-focus on the moment. Uh, to the exclusion of anyone else or anything else. And while you might fix the problem, you're not actually helping. And the thing is, at the end of it, you probably will ask to be thanked. Then blame. Oh, why have you gone back? Well, there we go. OK, uh, blame. If it wasn't you, in the words of Shaggy, um, it is so tempting to try and broadcast that to everybody right, to self-preserve, self to say, hey, you know, I might have even warned that this was going to happen, to make sure that everybody who could possibly know that this isn't on you knows it. But that's not really useful in the moment. Like, what real good does it have for everyone to know that it wasn't you? Because basically, what you should be focusing on is how to fix it. And then at the core again of all of this, is shame. Um, because somehow that little voice inside our heads that's telling us that we are not good enough and we are not worthy is exactly the one telling you that this whole situation is because you are this terrible cringe failure of a human and it doesn't make you act like you're best, the best possible person. So how do we become the best possible versions of ourselves when things start to go wrong. Other than therapy, because I think therapy is the main way. Well, let's go back to in the moment if it's not your mistake. First, it's very similar to the first one. Take a minute. Possibly the best thing you can do in that moment is go and make everyone a cup of coffee. Or if you're remote, Suggest everyone takes five, put the kettle on, take a breath, and then regroup. By displaying calm and like chill about the whole thing, you're going to get a better result. Two, it is, um, yes, be curious about your own reactions. Curiosity is my superpower. The day that I learned to substitute curiosity for judgment was a game changer. If you start feeling anxious or angry or defensive, notice it because, and then work out what's underneath it because that's going to be your best way to counter it. Two, uh, take everyone with you. So again, don't jump in and start fixing things. In fact, if at all possible, let the person who made the mistake drive. Just help, give advice, be reassuring. There's nothing more empowering than fixing your own mistake. Choose your language really carefully. How, why did you do that lands very differently to tell me what led us to come to this point. If you are, if you are um, using accusatory language, like all of this has got its uh, roots in, in um, nonviolent communication. If you're talking about the situation as a neutral thing, you're likely to stop people getting defensive and you're way better to have a, a better result at the end of it. But all of this is easier if you've got a culture of safety and a, a good culture of normalizing all of this stuff. Talk about your failures as well as your successes. Like, talk about the things that you find difficult as well as the stuff that you find easy. Because in a workplace where people are just really chill about making mistakes as well as doing the right thing, it's so much easier for everybody else to 
join in and feel comfortable putting a light on stuff. Be so careful of your own perfectionism. If you berate yourself for every little mistake, then people are going to think that you are holding them to that same standard, that you think of them in the terms you're talking about yourself. Perfectionism can be really, really toxic. The rest of this talk is a little bit of a love letter to a blameless culture, a culture where we look at the what happened rather than the who did what. And I'm going to talk about a couple of the reasons why I love blameless cultures. One, they just foster psychological safety. They mean that people feel comfortable shining a light on the things that they're doing, that they feel like they can do their best work and they can make a mistake and rectify it, and things will be better next time. The biggest disasters that have ever happened come from somebody trying to cover up a mistake. Like, take Chernobyl, for example. Like, the small mistakes are easy to fix. It's the ones that are compounded by cover-up and like, patching things together that are really, really dangerous. Two, working together is so much better than, than being in a silo and trying to fix things. Working as a team to fix problems bonds a team. It makes you all feel so much safer and, and better together. And it promotes trust. And what better to trust and be trusted by the people you work around? Now, a little caveat here, because some people use blameless culture in a way that is not really blameless. Now, a true blameless culture is just literally you are only looking at the causes and what could be better. Um, what we can sometimes have is things like an accountable culture. Now, accountability is good, right? We love that word. We like being accountable for things. But accountable can actually be a fancy word for blame. Uh, sanctionless as well. Like, uh, a sanctionless means that, you know, no, nothing's going to happen to you. You're not going to be fired. Like, but it's still attributing blame to somebody rather than the whole situation. A really good sum up is from Sidney Decker, who is a professor of uh, human factors. And he basically says that if you use the mistake as a starting point rather than a cause, you're opening everything up. Like, what allowed that mistake to cause whatever it did? That's at the heart of things, because that's what this is all really about. Like, no human should be able to do something that is a disaster, no matter how sleep-deprived they are. But the bad news is, I guess, I and mean, it's not really bad news, mistakes are going to happen. But the good news is that we're going to learn from it. We're going to come out better. And actually, it's on the path to having like real success. So I'm going to leave you with the words of some great philosophers, Bill and Ted. Be excellent to each other. And um, yeah, long live hug ops. Thank you.